Hello everyone, this tutorial I'm going to be showing you how I did Dingo the German Shepherd in pastels. Now if you've seen my other tutorials here on YouTube you'll know that I like to start with the eye most of the time. If I've got a background I will always do that first. The reason for that is when I come to then do the subject and I've got my background in place any fur that needs to overlap the background I can go ahead and do that. One of the most biggest things to, to remember when we are doing backgrounds or even if we are just drawing on a coloured paper of any kind that we want to make sure that that fur overlaps the background where it needs to. If that isn't the case and that doesn't happen the subject will just look like a sticker that's been stuck on which is obviously not what we're wanting. So my biggest tip would be to make sure that you study that photo, see where the fur overlaps and really do cover the background where needed or as I say just the pastel matte paper if that is your surface of choice. And that brings me on to my paper options. I always like using pastel matte. I've tried other pastel papers, but they just do not grip the pastel in the same way. The color saturation is nowhere near as good and you can't layer in the same way neither. So pastel matte paper has always been my preference. Now my main aim for this portrait was the contrast. I had a beautiful photo to work from. I was asked to do this as a tutorial for Patreon and I was only asked to do the eye and the area around it to show how I would do this kind of markings. But when I saw the reference photo and I saw just the contrast, the lighting and his expression, I just decided to draw the whole portrait and then make this into a full length tutorial on Patreon. Now when I am working on a fur type like this I do block in where my lights and my darks are just like with any other portrait but I want to make sure that I get that contrast in. Now as you can see I am making sure that I've got a colour based foundation down first and I'm using pan pastels for this but my contrasts are what I'm focusing on at the moment. I'm mapping in where my shadows are, where my highlights are and then I'm going to start mapping in with the pencils that I'm using here, the mixture of Carbofello, Pit Pastel, I've got the Derwent and the Caran d'Ache as well, all start to layer those fur details on top. Now the one thing that you'll notice is with any portrait that I've got here on YouTube I always leave the final lighter layers and the details till the very end. What we want to be doing is the fur that's closest to the skin first. So that in most cases is going to be working from dark to light. Now there are fur types where there is exception to that and I have a fur tutorial here on YouTube showing how I draw light curly fur and it's a labradoodle and that I do approach slightly differently because I want to make sure that I've still got that light colour of the coat in place so I don't make my base layers too dark. But for something like this where I'm building up from a brown base layer, building up my yellow ochres up to more of my yellower and cream values, I do like to put that darker base layer down first. Now when I'm drawing fur, I speak about this very in depth in all of my Patreon tutorials, is how to hold the pencil to get the desired fur type, the texture that you're after. Because I do find that using pastel pencils is very similar to using a paintbrush with acrylics. How much pressure you put on that pencil, how sharp that lead is, where you're holding it on the barrel and then how you're moving your hand will all massively affect the pencil strokes for the fur type that we're after. And obviously in the much slower and real time versions I'm able to actually explain that as I'm doing it. And if Patreon tutorials are of interest I'll link that in the description below. The nearly 4 hour version of this portrait of Dingo, Dingo is available over there now and the line art and the reference photo are also attached so anybody who wants to follow along to this tutorial are able to do so. Now the one thing that I do like to do on my tutorials is I have a mixture of different options. So I've got some where my base layers are with pan pastels, others where I'm using sanded soft pastel sticks and then there are some where it's just the pastel pencils on their own. Now I'm fairly new to using pan pastels and I am still making sure that I'm finding techniques on how to use them that work best with how I like to layer for fur. I can see one of the most common complaints where people say that it's very easy to fill the tooth of the paper and yes I can see how that would happen. I do have videos on Patreon showing you how I personally avoid that and the key to it is just to fill up the tooth of that paper gradually. We don't want to be filling all of that tooth on the very initial layer as you can see here there is still some of that pastel matte paper showing through. If I want to make a, a colour darker with the pan pastels I will just apply a second layer. I won't actually get more of that pastel pigment on my soft tool. But as I say there are videos, real time live voiceovers over on Patreon where I'm explaining all of this in depth. Now the one biggest thing that I really do take extra time in doing is making sure that my base layer stages are as accurate as they can be. 
As you can see for the bridge of the nose area here and the side of his face, I haven't gone down with one set colour. I am still making sure that I'm looking at that reference photo to see where my lights and my darks are. If I notice there's more of a browner colour, I will make that extra effort at the base layer stage to put that colour in at that time. And when I start working on the nose, it really does start to emphasise the contrast in this reference photo. The nose and the area around the eyes was really dark, so I was really keen to make sure that I captured that because the fur and everything else around it was so light, it really did create so much of a beautiful atmosphere within the reference photo. I also decided to keep the really strong blue highlights which were in the photo within that portrait. Sometimes what I do is use a little bit of artistic license where maybe a dog's laying down on some grass and you've just decided to do a head and shoulder portrait so you remove some of that grass tint that's reflected up from that area around it. We can then make those decisions to remove that from the pet portrait should we want to but there are times where we might want to include it and this was certainly the case. Now as I was asked to do this by a Patreon member, I wanted to make sure that I kept it as close to the reference photo as I could, but even though that was the case, I would have still made sure that I've incorporated these blues, because it really did add to the atmosphere within this portrait. And once the rest of the dog starts to get drawn in, as you can see from the finished portrait in the corner, it doesn't look as obvious, because I'm going to be pulling all of those blue and purple colours within the other areas around the nose. Now something I do cover a lot in the longer version of this tutorial is the fur length. It's something that we need to pay attention to regardless of the subject that we're drawing. Now you may have a breed like a Staffordshire Bull Terrier where overall the fur length is the same regardless if it's on the face or the body. But when you're drawing a German Shepherd like Dingo here, that is very, it's never the case. The fur is going to be shorter on the face and then longer on the neck and the body. And obviously because the German Shepherd can also be more of the short coated version or a long coat, you're going to have more variation depending on the dog itself. So my one biggest tip when you are working on the German Shepherd portrait is really study that fur length depending on the area of the dog that you're working on. And it will start to become apparent as we get a little bit longer into this video how I start to elongate my pencil strokes as I get down to the neck and the chest. I really wanted to make sure that I've got that difference in texture even though the fur of this fur type is soft regardless of where it is on the body, you know, on the face and the, and the chest itself it's going to be very similar but the fur length is going to change. So where you do notice that it's really important to make sure that you capture that as best as you can in your drawing. Now majority of the time a German Shepherd will have ears that are upright like this. You may sometimes get them maybe as a puppy or a young dog where they might be tipped over in the middle, but for most of it they are going to have an ear shape of this, this kind. The one biggest thing that I could recommend is really study that photo. The lighting's going to vary depending on, on that photo that you're working on, but you really want to make sure that you get the shape of the ear correct. Most of the time that means to have a darker middle section and then the pattern of the fur on the two outer edges. Depending on the fur colouring, it's going to be lighter on the edges or darker, and as you can see in this case, Dingo's is darker. It's got a lighter pink middle section, but it is darker lilacs with a bit of that darker grey over the top to show that there is that shadow on the deeper section on the middle part of the ear. Getting the shape of these ears right is really important. It's going to be quite unique to that pet, but also we want to make sure that we're following the breed traits as well. As, as I say, it's all going to be individual, but most of the time a German Shepherd is going to have these dark markings around the eyes. They're going to have a couple of these stripes, the darker triangle marking in between the forehead and this shaped ear. So we want to be making sure that we are really studying this reference photo as closely as we can. So here at the moment is a prime example of where I recommend working from light, sorry, from dark to light. But in this case, I'm going over the top with a darker pencil because I noticed some of these blacker fur strokes were closest to the viewer. They were naturally sitting on top of everything else. So there is always going to be an exception to the rule. So really do make sure that as very best as you can, you study that photo. It is going to tell you where you need those fur strokes to be, the direction the fur is travelling in, how dark and how light that colour needs to be. And in terms of the fur direction, it's never random. Unless you've got a really long coated dog and it's potentially a windy day, 
those that fur is obviously going to then change in some more random directions but when you've got a fur type as short as this nothing is it doesn't move in a specific way for that random reason such as the wind for instance the fur direction with a short coat like this on the face is it's following that direction due to the muscular and bone structure underneath the skin so if we don't get the fur direction correct on the face, we are going to change the anatomy of that dog and ultimately the finished portrait is not going to look as much as that resemblance should be. And again, this is something that I talk about in every single tutorial. It's really important to make sure that it's captured as it should. One of the things that I did used to do when I was first started to draw, and I was, I was using colour pencils at the time, but I was wanting to always make the fur on the top of the head too flat. So what I would do is I'd curve it over the top of the eye and then I'd make it just go very horizontal. Whereas as you can see on Dingo's face here, it does always slope down towards the middle but left side. And if you're working on the right hand side, obviously that would be in the opposite way, but it always does slope down to a degree. So it is really important to make sure that we capture that because the problem that would happen if we do make these the top of the head too horizontal, we'll end up making it look too wide and too broad. So we're going to be really changing the anatomy of his face. And here where I'm working on the side of the face, that's another example of that. I'm really making sure that I'm curving my fur strokes to make sure that I'm following that structure underneath the skin. Here this fur starts to change direction because he is smiling, he's panting, so you've got those creases and it is pushing up that fur direction to flow in a slightly different manner. So it is important to study that photo all the time and try to avoid the temptation of just drawing the fur because you assume you know what it looks like. Keep looking back at that photo every five or ten seconds I'm usually glancing at my photo in between stages to make sure that I'm following that photo as closely as I can. Now one of the biggest questions that I'm often asked here on YouTube is do I use a fixative? Now I personally don't like using fixatives, I have done it once before in the past and it ruined one of my pieces so it's something that I won't ever do again. If you have a, a bit of an issue with filling the tooth of the paper you can use a workable fixative and I don't see any problem with doing that because you haven't finished so you're going to be applying layers on top where you can then put the colour right again. But I wouldn't recommend using one as a final fixative but as I say that is just my personal preference because it will change the colour and also make your tonal value shift as well. If you have a white dog and you spray a fixative over the top it's quite well known that it will make that white fur go more of a greyer tone. So it is something that I don't personally do that doesn't necessarily mean it's the right thing to do it's just the right thing that I find is for my artwork. My preference is always to mount my pastel pieces and then I get my clients to frame them. As soon as they're behind glass, there really is no problem. It's fully protected by that layer of glass and I haven't had a problem. Now pastel matte paper is my paper of choice as I mentioned at the beginning of the video and that is designed the way you do not have to use fixatives. It's actually got, you know, it states that. So because it grips that pastel as well as what it does, I've never experienced any of this pastel dust falling down onto my mount. So because it's going to be behind glass, no one's going to be touching the surface of the drawing anyway. So that, as I say, is just my preference. And one of the most frequently asked questions that I, I did have by Patreon members is to make a video showing how I mount my work. So that is also available over on Patreon as well. And if there's any of the tutorials that you think might be of use, I have got a Patreon library over on my website, which I'll also link in the description below and it's got all of my tutorials listed out there so that you can see the, the sort of content that I've got on my Patreon channel. And as soon as you uh, subscribe to it, you can have access to all of those tutorials to that tier. And the good thing with that is you can also cancel at any time as well. But if you have any questions about Patreon, then please don't hesitate to contact me. Email or any of the social media is absolutely fine, even in the comments below in this video. Also one of the other quite difficult areas is the mouth and the gum area. So what I made sure is in the Patreon videos that I did slow this area down considerably to make sure that I could really show all of these little details. The biggest thing to consider when we're working on an area like this is your lights and your darks because in order to make an area look like it's wet, like the inside of the mouth, it is all about your highlights and your shadows. So we want to be making sure that we're putting these bright details where they need to be to show that you've got these little, almost like these little um, creases and indentations within that gum area.
And that would be the same process with the tongue. You can see that I started off with a darker layer and I built up my lighter details on top from there. The one thing that was quite unique to Dingo is he's got these dots on the tongue. Going back to what I've mentioned before, these are unique to him. So it's really important that we get these details in the right place and as accurate as we can because it is things like this that your client will notice if they're not right. And when I planned this, this drawing and started it, I knew that I wanted to make the chest fur really fade out. This was the first time that I used the sand coloured pastel matte paper and I really did enjoy working on it. It's a really nice colour. But because Dingo was quite a, a similar colour to this paper, I wanted to really fade out his chest fur so that it almost looked like a seamless transition between his fur and the paper. There is no background on this, it is just the sand pastel matte paper showing through and as I say I knew that I was going to be able to create that nice blended transition. So what I've done towards that outer edge where I've used that soft tool, I've really pulled that pigment down to keep making that blended edge as soft as I could. And if you are trying to get a seamless transition, the key to it is to avoid too many details closer to that edge. You'll notice that I'm keeping all my pencil marks roughly, you know, closer towards the top of the face there and easing off as I get lower down towards the faded section. So I really hope this video was of use. If it was, I'd really appreciate it if you could give it a thumbs up because it really does help. And if you'd like to get notified of future content, hit the subscribe and the bell button. And I will also be uploading another video to YouTube very soon. As I've mentioned, if the, the Patreon lessons are of interest, they're much slower, you know, up to four hours long, sometimes longer. I'll put all that information in the description below. And as always, thank you so much for watching.